Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Father Basil North, who is a member of the Order of Canons Regular of the Holy Cross. He's preached for retreats for members of the Opus Angelorium around the United States. He is the prior of the Monastery of the Holy Cross. With Father Basil North, we go inside the pages of Holy Silence, a practical guide to recollection in God, published by Sophia Institute Press. Father Basil, thank you so much for joining me. I'm very happy to be with you. I am so grateful for Holy Silence, a practical guide to recollection in God. It is so lovely and I think so necessary for today's world and particularly for the today's Christians, Catholics, for anyone who wants to climb higher on that holy mountain or even go deeper in that spiritual life. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Tell us about what brought you to compile or to expand on these great teachings. Well, it happened that many years ago when I began my formation as a religious, someone gave me a conference on silence. And at the end of the conference, this priest gave me a list of 12 types of silence that were written by a Carmelite nun from France from the 19th century. And I found it very helpful for myself. It just had the name of the type of silence and a very short description. But using that over the years of my formation, I kept coming back to it as a kind of examination of conscience. So it was very helpful for me. And then after ordination, I was working in a parish in Detroit, and I was asked to give preach a retreat to a group of, of secular Carmelites. And when I was trying to figure out a, a, a topic that would be fitting for them, I remembered that list. And... I elaborated three conferences on those 12 types of silence, and it was very well received. And so over the years, I continued preaching retreats in various places around the country, around the world, and I very often came back to that topic, and I found that the people really it resonated with people, this, this way of examining ourselves in the practice of holy silence. And so eventually, after many years of preaching about it, I finally decided to write a book, which was a presentation of the different conferences, but also I added a little more reflection in the book itself. What I love so much is the offerings that holy men and women, more often than not, they're all saints that are quoted in the book that have experienced the beauty of this type of silence and I think their contribution to it in this work really makes a difference, doesn't it? Yes, yes. You can see that it's a, a topic that it's, it's very much an integral part of the Catholic understanding of, of our spiritual life. Our, it's a basic building block, and the saints recognize that. But who knew that you could take silence, which I think for many of us is a how do I want to describe this? A, a negative. It's a taking away. It's a causing to remove things. I don't think we look at it as you bring forward for us that silence is actually very embodied, isn't it? It is very active in its nature. That's what I try to show that silence in itself, a holy silence in itself is not a negative in itself, but it's a positive disposition that opens our soul to listen to God's voice, to obey God's will. And so it's a fundamental disposition of openness. So it's not simply a negative reality of removing the noise, but it's a it's necessarily linked with a disposition to listen, to open up ourselves to the holy voice of God and our guardian angel. I think sometimes we get confused. We think we need to be silent, that it, as I said, it's as much of a removal of sound or, but actually 
it entails that what you just spoke of, that great listening. Isn't that at the key of the of what obedience is? Obedience is that deep listening. And in this case, who should we be listening to more than anything else? As you point out, it's God. We should be listening to him in all things. Yes. I mean, as I point out in the book, there are various forms of silence in the sense that there are also unholy types of silence as well that we have to avoid. But a true holy silence necessarily is linked to our, it's based upon our faith, obviously, our faith and our hope, our charity, which, which is the, the charity, which is a, the form of all our virtues. But it's based upon our, our faith that God loves us and he has a plan for us. He has a plan for us in every day of our lives. It's not just a, a generic plan that he has, but he has a very detailed plan for our lives, his will enters into his providence, enters into all the different details of our lives. And But for us to be able to recognize that in the things that just seem to happen by chance, by blind fate, but I mean, the silence is what helps us to recognize there is no such thing as blind fate. Everything is from the loving hand of God, and there's a reason for it. But for us to be able to discover that reason, we need to be listening to him. We need to be on the same wavelength as our holy guardian angel who will help us understand what's going on. I think we have to acknowledge, don't we, that for many of the, uh, the saints that you've written about and they talk about the importance of silence, they didn't live in a time period such as ours where there is so much noise. I mean, they experienced it and they warned about noise but could they have conceived of the type of what you termed intentional noise that is deliberately created, willingly sought, readily accepted, and I'm quoting the book now, as opposed to the noise that we cannot avoid and find undesirable? Yeah, Cecily, that is exactly why I thought it would be important to provide this in book form, because it's a kind of book that you don't just read once, you have to keep going back. For me, I, I've given this conference hundreds of times, and every time for me it's a, it's a reminder of these basic principles to be able to go back. And because exactly our world is very noisy, the opportunities that we have to create all manner of noise in our lives is multiplied every year. The means of technology is always advancing to create new addictions, new 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 forms of noise, that, uh, ways of accessing noise with greater and greater ease, and so it's it's a it's a great challenge that we have to face in this modern world. Yeah, I love the line that you have in the book as well. It says, "Silence is a positive reality that nurtures our souls. It protects the divine life within us and allows it to mature." I mean, that, I think, is what we desire. We may not even realize, but we truly do desire that more than anything else, don't we? I hope so. <laughs> I think when we experience it, there is, even with people who don't have the faith, there's a certain recognition of the need to disconnect, to unplug, to get out into nature, into the silence of nature. People recognize that need. Because it's just psychologically speaking, it just becomes too excessive. It becomes impossible to really attain, a, a, to, to a, come to a, a tranquility, interior tranquility, a peace inside without doing that. And so it's even more the case for us who seek to advance in our life in Christ. We need this protective wall. As the, as the image I, I use in the introduction is, it's like we have the garden of our soul in which God wants to walk, and but the garden needs a protective wall in order to exactly nurture that garden, to protect that garden against the rough winds that may do damage. So it is a, a nurturing reality. Well, Father Basil, what I love so much about the book is that in its approach to silence, 
that reminds me so much of the teachings of the Desert Fathers all those centuries ago, the Benedictines, and of how that ladder, essentially, it's the 12 steps of silence, and it's a way to really practically enter into that to, as you've pointed out, to do it almost an examination of conscience in the respect of our prayer life. Yes. Certainly the, the Desert Fathers really understood, even at their time when they didn't have the technology that we have, they saw a need to get out of the cities because they saw the noise of the cities, the busyness of daily life was a distraction for them, for their their vocation. I mean, there are people who have the vocation to, to work in the city and to stay there. But the Desert Fathers who really saw that their vocation was to provide for the church a contemplative foundation for the church, they saw that they needed to go out into the desert where there was no distraction. And even, now there's an interesting story, I believe I quote in the book, of one of the desert fathers who was living in, in Egypt in the desert, and someone's visiting him and says, well, why don't you, why are you in this desert where it's so difficult to to have a garden. You have to go walk at how many miles in order to get your water. You can come to France, and it's much more um, lush and beautiful and more abundant in the water and so on. But the Desert Father says, I realize that even here in Egypt, our place is closer to the Nile where it's lush. But we seek something other than that. We're seeking God. We're seeking, I mean, so it was an extraordinary vocation that they had, something that was exceptional that we can admire and perhaps never imitate. But there is a certain element of truth that applies to everyone in a certain way, that we all need a time of desert, a time of freedom from these distractions, whether it's an annual retreat, but also in our day-to-day lives, we need to have a time of silence, of adoration, of prayer, of a kind of being alone with God that's necessary for everyone. Well, you have to start with the first step, and I think this is the essential one. All of them, all 12 of them are important, but this one is the silence of speech. Not only our own talking, but the communicating that we have with others that sometimes it just becomes so bloviated. (laughs) We have speech everywhere, don't we? I mean, not only what we say on the phones, on texting, but what we're getting on cable and so many different things online. Yes. Yes. So it is, again, the modern technology has multiplied the means of communication, which is the means of we can speak not only to the people who are physically with us, but we can speak to people on the other side of the world now. We can speak at any time we want, any place we want that's and beyond that, beyond speaking, we can write. We can write messages, emails, or text messages, or as yeah. So that's part of the challenge of our modern society is because we have such an ease of communication that we have to have also a corresponding discipline in our, in our communication to know what's worth actually saying, what is actually edifying. Because our Lord said that we going to we will be judged by our every idle word. If that's the case, then we really need to take seriously our the discipline of our speech. So that's the fundamental form of silence. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions, which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, 
Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Father Basil Nortz about his book, Holy Silence, A Practical Guide to Recollection in God. Yeah, I think we have to remind ourselves that just because you can say something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> just as a just a reminder for myself, if anything, that culminate and detraction are still sins. You know, it's, we have to be careful with that, don't we? Uh, very careful, yes. Even, so you have defamation, which is saying something that's true about a person, but to people who have no right to know, they have no need to know. And cal- calumny is to say something false about somebody that would damage the reputation, which is even more serious. But people don't, yeah, many often often don't recognize that defamation is a serious sin. If I, and something that causes damage not only to the reputation of the person being defamed, but it causes damage to the people who are listening and to the person who's talking, something that it's a kind of communicating a kind of poison, a spiritual poison into the soul of somebody. And just recently dealing with a case of somebody who began to send emails about a very scandalous happening, but he sent it to people who have no right to know that and the people who find out about this are shaken and that they don't have the maturity to be able to deal with this information. And that's the problem. To publicize scandalous things, even if they're true, can damage a person's faith in the church because they don't make the proper distinction between the Holy Church and these unholy members of the church. So yeah, it's like the discipline in speech is very, very important art of our living our faith. I think you help us with such a positive remedy in that beginning every activity, you say, whether work, study, or recreation, by praying the Sanctus. It's a means of, as you, as you write, is a means of synchronizing the activities with the peace of heaven. And so thank you for that, because that really was a, a real gut check for me. Well, that actually is not something I came up with, but it's a custom within my religious community. We that's what we do. We before we play soccer, we'll pray the sanctus together. Before we begin recreation or watching, even if we watch a movie together, we'll begin with the sanctus. It's a custom that we have, which I find ex- extremely helpful. Exactly because it, it's always a constant reminder that we're in the presence of the angels. We're in the presence of God. And whatever we do, we want to do in the presence of God. And it helps us with that awareness, helps us to be more vigilant as to what we do and what we say and then the activity. Gosh, I wish we had all the all the time we could in, in one conversation here to hit on all the different 12 points, because I think they're so important, like silence of the body and silence of the senses. Those 
incorporate kind of each other, don't they, in some ways? I mean, they're distinctive, but they also kind of speak to how we are made, don't they? Yes, yes. It's a bit, I mean, to recognize that our spiritual life, our life in Christ is necessarily incarnate. It has to reflect itself in our bodily and sense life. And so when I speak about this silence of the body, I treat uh, particularly the trying to avoid unnecessary haste, not allow the spirit of haste to rule our lives, to be running from one thing to the next, one activity to the next, overactivity is a great danger in the spiritual life. Even if our activities are in themselves good things, for for instance, a priest who is working in a parish, he goes from one good thing to another, but he's in this running from one thing to the other, he loses that reflection, that re- realization that he should be praying more, he should be allowing prayer to penetrate more the activities that he's, he is doing. So that's something we have to the challenge of avoiding what the fathers of the church would call spiritual sloth, which is a running from the difficulty of confronting God in silence, because that's a, it's a, not an easy thing. So people very often immerse themselves in many activities, and that's what I treat mostly in the, the silence of the body, whereas the silence of the senses has to do with you know, our, our, the, the input that we willingly allow into our eyes and our ears and our sense of touch and, and so on. That's another thing that needs a, a, the discipline in order to be able to, because the senses are like the gateways to our soul. And we need to be very careful what we allow into those gateways so that we can protect, again, that garden where God wants to remain in our soul. I remember as a young mother once watching EWTN and uh, Mother Angelica was speaking about the controversies around a particular movie that was out, and it involved a depiction of the life of Christ and his passion, which she said, some things don't need to be seen with our eyes. And in this particular case, it was it revealed something that she said, there are things that you can see and you'll never be able to take them out of your mind. They will never they will never disappear. So you have to guard what you are seeing, what you allow your, at least as parents, what your children are seeing as long as you can to kind of protect that because it is a precious gift that we've been given. Yes, yeah, so that is the case that what we allow into these gates of our senses, it's sometimes not so easy to remove it again. As you say, it's something, things that are seen that we would prefer not to have ever seen. So we need to have a great deal of care. And this is what leads us to the also the silence of the imagination, because the imagination is the storehouse of all that sense data that we receive through our senses. It remains in our soul through our imagination. And so the question is, how do we purify our imagination? How do we form our imagination through meditation, through exposing ourselves to good and holy images or things that or that can help edify our soul? Yeah, I love the fact that you have such a beautiful relationship with the angels and you're constantly bringing them into this conversation about silence, that in this section on the imagination, you will say, This is why the imagination is such a key faculty and very much fought over by both the good angels and the bad angels. Exactly, because St. Thomas Aquinas says the the angels normally don't have direct access to our intellect or our will, but they have access to us through our imagination. And so this is where the deformation of our imagination through bad images or bad listening to things that we shouldn't listen to and so on, is something that gives the enemy more matter to work with in our soul. Whereas to the extent that we strive to form our imagination according to the vision of faith, according to meditating on the sacred scripture, 
it's giving the holy angel more material to work with to guide us and to keep us on the correct road to God. So the angels are very important because that's there are spiritual contact in the sense that all grace comes from Jesus Christ. We believe that he mediates that grace through his blessed mother, the blessed Virgin Mary. But she, as the queen of the angels, allows our guardian angels to apply those graces directly to us. So St. Thomas Aquinas says that we need our guardian angel for every actual grace, which is for, in our day-to-day life, what is necessary for making any meritorious act, we need the help of our guardian angel. And so it's very important for us to be aware and to concern ourselves with that contact point. The imagination is something very important for our angel to be able to guide us better. And I, again, in the book, what you do is not only talk about the things that we should probably stay away from, push aside, but also the things that we can embrace, like instead of poor literature, pulpy type of books or that really don't lead us anywhere, as you would call them cheap thrillers or romances, but embrace the quality literature, quality art, beautiful music, those types of things that enter into our imagination and lift up our hearts in ways that are, I mean, that's that's key, isn't it? Yes, it's very important. And it's interesting in the history of the church that how the church really defended the the ability, I mean, the, the, that we need sacred art, we need sacred paintings and sculptures and so on. It was a very difficult fight many centuries ago against the iconoclast who wanted to remove all this. And there were even bishops and priests and other lay people who were martyred in the defense of sacred art, which is amazing for us today. But but it's so important, as you say, to to contemplate well done sacred the icons particularly, the, the, the sacred art which has a purity, a simplicity, which is a true window to heaven in the sense that it gives us a possibility to look in, see the face of Christ, and realize that he's looking back at us, and Our Lady, and the Holy Angels, and the saints, that their sacred art should help us to maintain that awareness of our walking in the presence of many witnesses that are here to cheer us on in our day-to-day life. The one that I found so curious, and I I'm so glad it's in there because I had never thought about this, was the silence of memory. And you say that this kind of silence, the aesthetics of old, placed a great value on this. Uh, Particularly St. John of the Cross has a passage where he talks about how much the abuse of memory can cause a great deal of spiritual damage. People who are fleeing the difficulty of the present moment by thinking of the good old times in the past and getting lost in these things, or someone who reflects upon some sinful action in the past and and relishes it in the present. So there's different ways that we can abuse the memory, whereas there are very important ways that we have to use the memory. Obviously, our whole faith is based upon the remembering of the great works of God's providence in the history of salvation and also in our own particular life to remember with gratitude the graces that we have received throughout our lives. So there's a proper use of memory that's very important to sustain us and sustain our faith and confidence in God. But there are ways of abusing memory that can be very, very damaging. So that's why we have to, again, be vigilant in the use of the memory. We'll conclude our conversation in our next episode. With Father Basil Nortz, we've gone inside the pages of Holy Silence, A Practical Guide to Recollection in God. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app 
or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.